Sons of the Forest plops you on an island, surrounds you with cannibals, and challenges you to survive. There are moments of brilliance, but also moments that fall a bit flat. My name is Kodiak, this is Legacy Gaming, and today I'm sharing my brutally honest impressions of Sons of the Forest. So to level set with you all, I did not play End Knight's first game, The Forest. However, Livid, the other half of this channel, was an avid fan. What that really means is we're coming at Sons of the Forest with both experience and a completely fresh perspective. We won't necessarily be comparing old to new, just looking at the experience with an unvarnished pair of eyes. If you're a new or potentially new player that sees the Steam charts popping off and you're wondering what this game is about, this video is for you. Now first let me say this, I'm a huge chicken, like a massive, don't want to go into the dark, don't want to dive underwater type of chicken. Jump scares are the bane of my existence, so I was hesitant to even play this game. Luckily, my compadres on the channel, Livid and Schmo, were riding shotgun, and straight off the bat, that cut down the anxiety by like tenfold. In Sons of the Forest, you can host up to eight people in a player-hosted server, which means plenty of friends to watch your back. Even still, we found ourselves diving into dark caves and creeping around at night, and I'll be honest, the horror factor wasn't as stark as I thought it would be. Sure, there are creepy things and they'll attack you, but oftentimes you know it's coming. This isn't a Resident Evil type game where things are lying in wait and the developers have coded that perfect jump scare. I for one found myself exhaling because I quickly got over the scare factor often associated with this game and moving forward could focus on the systems. Almost immediately, you meet Kelvin, a mute survivor of the crash and a simple laborer that will follow you around and do your bidding. I don't know why it's taken so many years before a survival game implemented a system like this, because it's brilliant. Kelvin can handle basic tasks like chopping down trees, collecting sticks, and getting fish. By using a simple menu, you can designate what he does and where he drops his haul, and I found this to be one of the most innovative things about the game. Instead of us cutting down trees the entire day, which I'll always admit is a cathartic experience, I can now reliably trust Kelvin to also get that job done, which freed me and the team up to do other things, such as build our base and explore. I can't understate how incredible this NPC system is, which makes it even more gut-wrenching when at the drop of a hat, it can all be ripped away. Yes, my friends, Kelvin can die, and once he's dead, that's it. Your lovable NPC is just a memory on this lonely remote island. Once I realized that Kelvin was gone for good, I was actually pretty upset, mainly because if you die in the game, you simply respawn with literally no consequences, at least on the normal difficulty. If Kelvin dies, nope, it's see you never. He's not coming back. For a system that's so crucial to the enjoyment of the game, to be ripped away just feels awful. Hopefully the developers change course here, especially on any difficulty below hard, because at this point my relationship with Sons of the Forest changed. With Kelvin gone, we had to manage our time a little differently. Less time could be spent exploring, and more intention had to be put into resource gathering and base building in order to ensure survival. On the gathering side, things feel familiar and decently immersive. Something as simple as chopping down a tree, been done a million times before, right? It feels fresh, thanks to the visual cues and dynamic chopping that accompanies the process. There are also nuanced interactions between systems like using a river to move logs downstream. It's a clever idea, one I've never seen utilized before. As far as the base building goes, it's a really interesting system that I find to be one of the more believable approaches to something so iconic in the genre. Here as well, there are nuances that take something simple like a log and utilize it in multiple ways during construction. Logs can be cut in half to form shorter logs or split down the middle to create planks. It's taking something simple and using it to do something more complex, which adds a nice layer of depth to the system. There also seems to be a good amount of freedom with the building, giving players the ability to manipulate most things in a way that works for them, which is a nice departure from some of the rigidity that accompanies a lot of other survival base building systems. Once we understood the concept of the base building, we found it to be pretty enjoyable. There are prefabs, which you can select from your field guide and place into the world. However, they're not complete until you supply the necessary resources. If you flip modes, that same field guide will teach you how to create things outside of prefabs, which is interesting, albeit frustrating at first. 
One of my biggest complaints about Sons of the Forest is just how murky all of the directions are, and I get it, that's kind of the point. While a real-world survival guide would come with explicit instructions how to do something, the devs had to remove some of those elements to provide more puzzle-like problems for players to solve. That being said, for an early access game, the ingredients are all there, and once you figure out how to translate the guide, it comes together rather quickly. At some point, we did hit a wall in our building, after about 10 hours or so, it felt like we had really created what we wanted to survive, and the depth of the prefabs and gameplay affecting things that you can implement as part of the base building system had really been tapped out. Now to be fair, there was more we could create, but the threat of attacks didn't merit sinking countless resources into a bigger and more elaborate base. Again, early access, so we do give the team a little flexibility, but this is a system that will need to be expanded upon in the future. With Livid holding down the base, it was time to explore, but which direction to go? Unfortunately, we have no idea, since the modern-day GPS map device doesn't have cardinal directions. Like, completely mind-boggling. What it does have, however, are various points of interest. At first, there was no rhyme or reason behind our discovery. We just followed our nose to whatever thing interested us. Luckily, we built our base close to one of the purple markers. Sadly, that marker was in the middle of an ocean, but after a brief encounter with a very angry shark, we figured out that these trackers are tied to other victims of the crash. That purple indicator is actually a GPS tracker that you can use as a sort of marker in the world, flipping it to whatever indicator you want to remember something by. The weird thing is, there's virtually nothing that would make me want to use this in its current state. This is one of my biggest gripes with the game. You have all this technology baked into a real-world GPS, yet in this game, the supposedly perfect navigation device doesn't have a compass or the ability to place waypoints or markers. It seems the devs ripped these two systems apart to artificially create unnecessary layers to the gameplay. This would have been a bit more plausible if, say, the device was partially damaged or had some other visual limitation, but it appears fully functional, just a super simple and almost meaningless device. It's something that was far more limiting and was the focus of my frustration way more than it needed to be. With one beacon in hand and a newly discovered pistol, we set out for our next adventure, which so happened to be halfway across the map. That's one thing worth pointing out. The map and the world feel massive. Visually, it's gorgeous, and the dense foliage and introduction of wind and seasons makes the world feel alive, but the sparsity of actual stuff to discover was a bit of a letdown. This is especially noticeable once winter rolls in and resources become sparse. You're forced to plan ahead and you can't rely on the land to supply what you need. As you're running around the island, you'll stumble across cannibal camps, and sometimes they're filled with one enemy, other times a whole host of enemies, but it's the simple act of finding something within the world that's most exciting. If the map had been about 75% the size it currently is, I think it would have felt perfect. Right now, you spend a lot of time running across the world, and at some point, you just end up beelining it from point A to point B without worrying about camps and such, because if you do, you'll never actually end up tackling your objective, which are often tied to progression. After connecting a few dots, we realized we needed access to a few different tools to move forward in the game. And while I won't spoil that for you, it was clear that the various caves dotted around the island were the key. The caves were dark and murky, as you'd expect, but also filled with our first taste of the mutated enemies. These caves provided the most challenge from a combat sense, mainly because we didn't have our base to protect us, but it did become a bit exhausting after a while. You run through a largely empty cave, come into a room and have to fight 10 different enemies. Run through some more, oh wait, another room with 10 enemies. Even with two of us using a stun baton and axe to keep enemies locked down, it was a pain, and we died far more times than we care to admit. It was clear these caves were the key to moving forward, but also one of the biggest choke points in terms of progression simply because of the combat scenario. This really ties into the last brutally honest impression I have about the game, the combat and survival elements. First, let's talk about combat as a whole. It is decent, but I wouldn't say revolutionary. From the player side of things, I never found anything to be overly satisfying. Swinging the base axe is probably the best from a physics and satisfaction point of view, but as soon as you branch out to things like the spear, pistol, and stun baton, it gets a little less impressive. Everything works, more or less, but it's not a memorable combat experience, and that's largely because of the lack of impact behind each of your attacks. 
Now on the flip side of things, I will say enemy AI is okay, but far from that next level experience the developers touted ahead of launch. There are some really interesting mannerisms where cannibals will jump on stumps and sort of taunt you, but there are also enemies that don't seem to have that same level of complexity and just sort of amble about. Whether it's cannibals or mutants, enemies seem to fall into one of two camps, either complex and interesting or plain and forgettable. Enemies do seem to have a sort of intent to them. One day a cannibal will simply wander into your camp, seemingly motivated to steal your hard gathered wood, and the next day they're here for blood. It's a neat duality to mob types to keep you guessing as to what their next move may be. Overall though, enemy design is hit or miss and something the team can address as development continues. Now in terms of the survival aspects of the game, you know, hunger, thirst, and energy, I did feel like the systems were something we had to constantly pay attention to, which became a bit of a chore. Luckily, filling those meters back up is pretty simple with food and drink almost always available, especially if you choose to explore and scavenge some cannibal camps. What I didn't really like was the lack of ways to provide a pipeline to those necessary resources right from your base. For example, growing items takes forever and doesn't seem to be a sustainable option, especially when playing with others. Likewise, the traps, both fish and small critter, are frustrating to use, and even with intense trial and error, it never seemed like a system we could perfect. Ultimately, we just relied on Kelvin to get us fish from the river, or scarf down a billion energy bars that we found throughout the world. However, there was one thing I absolutely loved once I warmed up to it, and that was the inventory and crafting system. When you first open up your inventory, you are overwhelmed with how different it looks. It's like a legit survival map with all of the things that you need strewn about, and at first glance, it's a bit much. However, once you get your bearings, I found this to be one of the cooler ways to deal with a survival inventory. I could visually see my items. They weren't just icons floating in some snappy UI, and that matters because crafting right from your inventory requires you to put together items from your mat, bring them to the center, and combine them. Overall, I really enjoyed this system and hope the team continues to expand the items players can make because it's quite a satisfying experience. So being brutally honest for a second, Sons of the Forest is already off to a great start. It absolutely scratches that survival game itch that our team has been having for quite some time. I think the early access tag bought the team a little wiggle room because there are aspects of the game that don't feel quite right, like the story, which is almost non-existent at this point. Other things like the massive open world and lack of stuff in that world also slightly missed the mark. That being said, there are plenty of high points, from the gathering and crafting, to Kelvin, the lovable NPC, to the base building. And while those systems haven't hit their full potential, there is more than enough to sink your teeth into. While not a full review of the game, I would say Sons of the Forest is already in great shape, and if you like survival games with a hint of horror element thrown in, you're going to really enjoy this experience. Add in a couple friends, and it takes the entire game to a different level. We'll be dabbling with Sons of the Forest for the foreseeable future, and we're excited to see how the game evolves over the course of early access. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed our brutally honest impressions of Sons of the Forest. If you want more impressions and worth your time reviews in your feed, consider subscribing to the channel. We've got a busy year on tap, and we're excited to share more content with you all in the future. I also want to invite you to join the Legacy Gaming community on Discord. We recently reworked our entire server, so if you're looking for a place to hang out, win free prizes, talk about great games, and group up with friends, check out the link in the description below. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.